This story took place in Russia in the late 90s, but it really began much earlier, back in the times of the USSR. On March 1, 1970, a boy named Sasha was born into this possessive family. The child was born prematurely, resulting in a frail constitution, but nevertheless, the mother adored her son and was ready to do anything for him. The family also had an older daughter, Nadezhda, but Sasha became his mother's favorite. Ludmila Spasevtseva enjoyed taking care of the boy. She needed to be needed by him and to feel his love. Alexander's father, Nikolai Spasevtsev, soon left the family. People said that he committed depraved acts on his own daughter and had an unhealthy love for alcohol. Ludmila was left to raise the two children alone, no easy task in the USSR in the 80s and 90s. The family lived in Novokuznetsk, a large Siberian city founded in 1616. Today, about half a million people live there. Many who are born there later moved to larger cities in hope of a better life. Novokuznetsk is one of the largest metallurgical and coal mining centers in Russia, and most of the residents work in this industry. In the 90s, Russia was experiencing a period of decline and Novokuznetsk was no exception. After the collapse of the USSR, many factories closed down, people were left jobless and impoverished, and crime flooded the streets. There was no hope for a brighter future. Everyone was just trying to survive. Children and teenagers wandered the city with nothing to do, while their parents tried to make ends meet. Unfortunately, some of these kids disappeared from these streets forever. This was the environment in which Sasha Spasevtsev, doted on by his mother, grew up. Just imagine, he was so close to his mother that they slept in the same bed until he was 12 years old. They were absolutely inseparable. The family lived in a very ordinary apartment in a very ordinary prefabricated Soviet panel house on Pionerska Street or Pioneer Street in English. By the way, almost every city in Russia has a street with this name. In those times when these identical grey residential areas were being built, street names were often inspired by the Soviet ideology. For example, Lenin Street, Communism Street, and Pioneer Street. The Pioneers was a Soviet communist organization for children aged 9 to 14. There, they were taught Soviet values and made into good citizens of the USSR. The specifics of relations with their neighbors were tense, mostly because of little Sasha who constantly misbehaved in the building's lobby. He would put matches in the lock or break the elevator or vandalize the mailboxes. And instead of having disciplinary talks with her son, Ludmila Spasivtseva would argue with the neighbors. How dare they blame her child? She constantly defended Sasha, both from the neighbors' complaints and from his school teachers who wanted to send him to a special correctional school. From a young age, Sasha stole things, and at some point he became interested in fascist symbols and began drawing them everywhere he could. But Ludmila didn't care, and the boy quickly realized that his mother would always be on his side, no matter what he did. Meanwhile, Ludmila herself was no angel. She worked as a school janitor and would take anything that was lying around, toilet paper, brooms, light bulbs, soap. After these items were found to be in short supply, the school kicked out their thieving janitor. After that, the woman got a job as an assistant to a blind lawyer, probably through her daughter who worked as a court secretary, and for lack of better options, began to take home entire criminal cases from the courthouse, along with their accompanying photographs. Sasha, being a curious boy, naturally discovered these documents and soon began to show an unhealthy interest in the details of the murders. His mother, upon learning of her son's new fascination, was simply delighted with his enthusiasm and began to bring him even more criminal cases from work, like a mother bird bringing home food to her chick. As Spasivtsev grew up, his interest in criminal matters didn't fade. After finishing school, he decided not to pursue further education and got a job as a handyman, repairing small household appliances. Alas, this work brought him neither joy nor money. The Spasivtsev family continued to live in isolation. They had no friends and none of the neighbors wanted to associate with them. They were a nuisance to the neighborhood, making noise, playing loud music and arguing with everyone. The family had no intention of following any rules. Ludmila and her children lived in their own closed-off world with its own set of rules. 
At the age of 20, Alexander Spasevtsev, unable to hold down a job, decided to join the army. But he was not accepted due to mental health concerns and was sent to a psychiatrist who prescribed him medications. However, he didn't follow the doctor's orders, a decision which would lead to dire consequences. Zhenia Guselnikova In 1991, Alexander met his first love, a 17-year-old girl named Zhenia Guselnikova. Zhenia, like him, was from an ordinary Novokuznetsk family and Spasivtsev planned to marry her. He courted her beautifully, reading her poetry and promising eternal love. In order not to interfere with her son's personal life, Lyudmila Spasivtseva and her daughter moved out of the apartment to a house in the country. Then one day, Zhenya and Alexandra had a fight, and he beat her so badly that she ended up in hospital. Then Spasivtsev came to visit her in the hospital and attacked her again there. Fortunately, the nurses who were taking care of Zhenya intervened and pulled her away. For some reason, after she was discharged, the girl came to Spasivtsev home again. Perhaps he apologized and promised her that things would be better. Or maybe Zhenya just wanted to take her belongings back. Whatever the case may be, the unfortunate fact is that the girl did not come out alive. Spasivtsev locked Zhenya in and played loud music to drown out her screams. The girl spent a whole month in Spasivtsev's apartment. It's not known whether his mother came to the apartment during this time. Most likely she did. However, no one helped Zhenya. The neighbors, accustomed to Spasivtsev's antics, remained silent, trying not to notice anything. Zhenya's parents apparently weren't looking for her either. She was living with a man and wasn't coming home in tears, so everything must be fine. A month after the abduction, on a tip from either the neighbors or the girl's parents, the police broke into Alexander's apartment. A horrifying scene awaited them in the bedroom. Jenny was lying on the bed without breathing, and Spasivtsev was sitting on the floor. The window was open. Spasivtsev would later say that he never touched the bodies for exactly three days after the death, leaving the window open so that the soul could depart. Spasivtsev was arrested. As he was being accompanied from the building, he managed to shout at the neighbors, You're to blame for her death. He claimed that someone had attacked Zhenya, and he was just trying to heal the girl's wounds. Of course, he was lying. The girl died from sepsis and exhaustion, and although the exact cause of death could not be determined, it was clear that her demise began due to the stab wounds inflicted by specifics of himself. Despite all the evidence of specifics of guilt, Lyudmila once again defended her son, believing in his version of events. In honor of his first victim, Spasevtsev later got himself a tattoo, the letter E, for Zhenya's full name, Evgenia. Instead of prison, Spasevtsev was sent to a psychiatric hospital having been declared insane. There, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. While he was in the hospital, Alexander decided to do something strange. He somehow managed to insert a shotgun pellet into his genital organ. In his imagination, this was supposed to bring pleasure not only to him, but also to his future partner. But since this operation was carried out in unsanitary conditions by a person without medical training, specifics have developed an inflammation which he couldn't get rid of. Now he was in unbearable pain every day and it didn't go away. After several years of treatment, the doctors believed that Spasivtsev no longer posed a threat to society and released him. However, they made a monstrous bureaucratic error in the process. They failed to inform the police responsible for the district. Usually, when a particularly dangerous criminal, such as a murderer, was released from a psychiatric hospital, the police were supposed to keep an eye on them and make regular visits to their home. But because the police were not notified of Spasivtsev's release, he was left to the discretion of fate. Alexander stopped communicating with anyone except his mother and the homeless people at the railway station, for whom he bought cheap port wine. In return, they became willing listeners to his delusional stories. Perhaps in the company of these people, he felt better and more successful than he actually was. In them, he finally found his faithful audience. In 1996, at the station where Spasivtsev constantly hung around, he met a girl named Yelena Trunova. She was a kindergarten teacher, only 20 years old. Yelena and Spasivtsev went to his home, where they became intimate. 
At some point during this encounter, Alexander admitted to his new acquaintance that he had a problem, the palate that was causing him so much pain. According to the maniac himself, the girl reacted inappropriately, as if accusing him of impotence. Specifsev got angry and attacked the girl. He took what he wanted from her and then disposed of the body in pieces. You go to sleep with pain and wake up with pain. Then someone else talks to your face about this illness or reminds you of it. I just hate, hate people like that, Specifsev later said. He asked his mother Ludmilla to get rid of Yelena. Ludmilla was still absolutely besotted with her son, bringing him food regularly and she obediently agreed to help him with a bloody task. The killer's mother cleaned up the apartment and then carried away in buckets to the Abba River what her son asked her to dispose of. Why did Ludmilla so calmly agree to become an accomplice? This question will haunt us several times throughout the story. Perhaps she had already disposed of something her son had brought home before. Nevertheless, the love of this mother, who almost had no reaction to a woman's lifeless body in the apartment, fed the maniac, who soon turned into a real monster. Yelena died in February. After that, Spasitsev began attacking not only women, but also children. In April, he met a group of teenagers at a construction site near his house and offered them to smoke. According to some sources, there were six of them, according to others, three, which is more likely. The man quickly gained their trust and suggested to go and rob an apartment. The children agreed. But why? As I mentioned earlier, in the 90s, even in small cities like Novokuznetsk, crime was widespread. Kids often fell into criminal gangs at a very young age, tempted by the idea of taking risks for money. The life of crime was romanticized and often associated with a degree of wealth which many did not have. Besides, Specifsev knew how to gain their trust and appear interesting to them despite his mental disorders. So the killer, accompanied by the boys, went to his own home. Yes, the apartment they were going to rob was his own. Once inside, the boys realized that something was wrong, but it was too late. The trap had slammed shot. All the teenagers who came to the apartment faced the same fate as the two previous women. And once again, his mother had to finish the job in buckets. By the way, this horrifying family didn't use the elevator, so Spasivtseva had to carry the buckets down from the ninth floor and back. I went out and when I came back, everything was clean, Spasivtseva later recalled. Mom took care of things. That summer, more than 40 children disappeared in Novokuznetsk, some of them at the hands of Spasivtsev. At first, those three teenagers got lost in the crowd. It took some time before their fate was discovered. In May, just a month after the boys went missing, Alexander Spasivtsev again went to the construction site, a favorite hangout for the youth of Novokuznetsk. There, he met a group of four teenage girls and invited them to go to his home, where supposedly he had soap for sale. Again, this is a story from the 90s. What exactly was meant by selling soap is unknown, but it clearly interested the girls who wanted to earn a little money. History repeated itself. True, this time it was not only the mother who helped, but also the family dog. The Spasivtsev had a Newfoundland who ate everything that was offered to him. This dog was quite aggressive, by the way. Spasivtsev used it to intimidate his guests. By the beginning of summer, about seven people had already lost their lives in Spasivtsev's apartment. Alexander's mother knew about this, as did his sister, who also sometimes came to the apartment. However, in their strange closed little world, all this was commonplace. Previously, Lyudmila and Alexander used to discuss criminal cases over dinner. Now, they had become direct participants. The terrible events in the apartment continued throughout the summer of 1996. While Spasivta was committing atrocities, the remains of several missing people were finally found in the city. They were discovered in the Abba River, where Alexander's mother dumped the gruesome contents of the buckets. Investigations began. The police determined the number of missing children in the city, filtered out those who were found and returned to their parents, and tried to figure out who it was that had been found in the river. 
the remains were extremely difficult to identify. The parents of the missing were sometimes called in several times to try and understand exactly whose children these were. Various theories were explored. Perhaps an amateur taxi driver was behind this. What about Satanists? Or could the attacks be related to black market organ trafficking? There were even speculations about a mutant man appearing in Novokuznetsk due to the poor air quality. But one thing was clear. The attacks took place in a calm atmosphere and the attacker had plenty of time. There was also a theory that the suspect preferred women named Olga and Yelena. A remarkable number of women with these names were missing in Novokuznetsk. A search began to look for the potential killer in the archives of all crimes against women. In the investigation, two individuals were discovered who had a particular hatred for Olga's and Yelena's. However, despite the efforts of the police and a campaign in which police women hung out by the side of the road in the hope that one of the suspects would pick them up and decide to continue the spree, the case remained unsolved. They also looked into the archives of mentally ill criminals in Novokuznetsk, but Spasivtsev was not there. Due to the negligence of the doctors, he was still listed in the hospital as a patient. There was another suspect, Grigory Gurin, a man working as a private chauffeur. Previously, Grigory worked as a butcher at the collective farm market, and he had a criminal record. Of course, the man immediately became a suspect because he knew how to properly butcher animals. Gurin was put under surveillance. One day, Grigory's neighbors called the police reporting a terrible smell coming from his apartment and red stains under the door. Law enforcement immediately went to the scene. The man was not at home. As it turned out, the day before he had been in an accident and ended up in hospital for getting several kilograms of pork at home. So case closed. The investigation once again hit a dead end. Around the same time, Oleg Rilkov, a serial killer who acted in much the same way as the Novokuznetsk Ripper, was detained in the city of Telyati almost 3,000 kilometers away. For a while, the police thought that it was Rilkov who was operating in Novokuznetsk, but the children did not stop disappearing after his arrest. Interestingly, during all this time, there were calls to the police about Spasivtsev. A neighbor complained about constant musing from Alexander's apartment and a pungent stench in the stairwell. She asked the police to check on this troublesome neighbor, but the police paid no attention. From June to the end of August, four schoolgirls, two adult women, and one 35-year-old man died in the apartment on Pionerska Street. Spasivtsev didn't care who he got his hands on. Often he was looking for either a group of girls or two sisters to gain their trust more easily and take them to his place. When teenagers or even older women were in a group, they felt more secure and thought that nothing bad would happen to them. Spasivtsev still wasn't taking the pills prescribed by his doctors. By the end of the summer, with his mental state deteriorating by the day, the killer stopped going outside. That's when his beloved mother began to go hunting. The unremarkable old woman calmly strolled around the neighborhood looking for girls, or why not underage children, to lure into the awful apartment. The Last Ones The last victims in Spasivtsev Lair were three teenage girls, 13-year-old Nastya Burnaeva and Genia Barashkina, and 15-year-old Alya Galtseva. The girls met Ludmila Spasivtseva in a store they were buying water and getting ready to go to a disco. The friendly grandmother asked them to help her carry her groceries home, promising the girls plastic cups in return. The three girlfriends, of course, agreed to help. However, when they reached the apartment, the girls realized they had walked into a trap. Alexander Spasivtsev met them in the hallway and began the attack right there. The first to die was Nastya Burnaeva, who tried to hit Spasivtsev on the head with a bottle when he was distracted. Jenny was crying and he was trying to inject her with a sedative. The maniac got angry and switched his focus to Nastya. There was a knife in his hand. I stabbed her several times, but she didn't die, Spasivtsev calmly recounted later. Soon it was all over. Only Oli and Jenny remained. Spasivtsev forced them to deal with their friend, so she would be easier to transport. Afterwards, he chained Olya and Jenya to the radiator and his mother brought them meat soup. 
Take a guess at what kind of meat it contained. In the corner, the doc was gnawing on the bone. He ate the spine, and he generally eats the ribs really quickly, Specifsif later recalled about his dog. At some point, another woman came into the apartment, most likely Alexander Specifsif's sister. Ole and Jenya were alive then, but when he learned that Jenya was planning an escape, Specifsif couldn't allow it. Now, only Ole remained alive. As always, he opened the window and didn't touch Jenya for three days, so that her soul could freely depart. Meanwhile, based on eyewitness accounts from the store, a sketch of Ludmilla was made, and incredibly, one of the police investigators recognized her. He remembered the ordinary grandmother and knew she had a son who was in a psychiatric hospital. The police began to check. Indeed, Ludmilla had a son, Alexander, but according to the information they had, he was in a psychiatric hospital. That's fine then, they thought, and forgot about Specifsev. In the end, the maniac was caught by pure chance. The police received a call from the municipality housing department. As it turned out, an employee from the building management company had been trying to enter apartment 357, where Specifsev lived for some time. He wanted to check the radiators before the heating season. However, every time he came to the apartment, a male voice answered him, saying that he was crazy, locked inside the apartment and couldn't open the door. Crazy. Didn't Ludmilla Specifsev live in the apartment? The police thought, and then it dawned on them. The police tried to call the housing department to ensure that they didn't send a locksmith to the apartment, but it was too late. By the time the police arrived at the scene, the worker had already opened the door to the maniac's house. What awaited the police and the unsuspecting locksmith inside can only be described as a scene from a horror movie. It's captured in documentary footage. I don't recommend watching it. The apartment was permeated with a sweet pungent odor. There was something in the bathroom that Specifsif mother had not yet managed to deal with. There was a Polaroid camera in the room and next to it some terrible photographs. A girl was lying on the bed. She was alive. It was Ola. While the door was being broken down, Specifsif managed to escape from the apartment via the roof. They took Ola, the last survivor, to the hospital, where they tried to question her as quickly as possible. There is a terrifying video from this interrogation, also not for the faint-hearted. Alia died of sepsis the day after giving her testimony. Despite their best efforts, the doctors couldn't save the girl. No one survived meeting Specifsev. A few days later, Specifsev returned home and surrendered directly to the police. The homesick boy couldn't survive on the run, and they caught him right outside the building. I had nothing left to do. I was denied treatment, and I had a weakened immune system. In the summer, I wrapped myself in a jacket and sweater. Look, my hands are covered in sores. The killer told the police immediately after his arrest, explaining why he returned. Both Specifsev and his mother were taken to the police station. The police even organized a confrontation during which mother and son accused each other of murder. I am responsible for four buckets, Ludmilla shouted. I've already earned myself four buckets. Shame on you. Why are you so angry with me? You're shameless. Why are you so angry towards me? I didn't eat any. Don't, Sasha. Don't say that about your mother. And you said that I ate cutlets. Shameless. Ludmilla never talked about the deceased as such, preferring to refer to the victims as buckets. The cutlets she mentioned, as you might guess, were not made from pork. Which one of this terrible pair was more guilty in the end? This question can never be answered. In total, Specifsev confessed to 19 murders. We don't even know the names of some of them. However, some believe there could be many more. Judging by the amount of clothing, jewelry, and watches found in the apartment, the family could have attacked as many as 80 people. This number, however, could not be confirmed. Perhaps Ludmilla and Alexandra simply stole things and brought home any old junk they found. Their apartment was a complete trash heap. Specifsev feared the death penalty. However, he was willing to donate his brain to science in exchange for a pack of cigarettes. He made this offer to one of the journalists during an interview. At first, the man was declared sane and was going to be fully prosecuted, 
But later, during an examination at the Serbsky Center in Moscow where the most extreme criminals were dealt with, Spasivtsev was confirmed mentally ill. To this day, he's being kept in a specialized psychiatric hospital near Commission. Most likely, he'll spend the rest of his days there. He's taken care of, they even cut his nails so that he can't harm himself. The maniac doesn't complain about his life there. He's fed properly, and in his spare time, he reads books, writes poetry, makes handicrafts, and draws. He even sends some of his drawings to his mother. The Spasivtsev's dreadful apartment was sealed, and like the neighbor's apartment, it now stands empty. By the way, people sometimes break into the house of horrors and even make videos about it. Lyudmila Spasivtseva received 13 years in prison for complicity and was released in 2009. Now, at 83 years old, she lives with her daughter and receives her son's pension, hoping that her beloved Sasha will one day be released. But since Spasivtseva is not subject to treatment, this won't happen. And even if it did, the man would be tried as sane and sentenced to life imprisonment. In 2013, after returning from prison, Ludmilla, together with her daughter, tried to break into their old apartment at night. But the pair were spotted by the other residents and kicked out of the building in disgrace. A few years ago, the Spasivtsevs appeared in the news again. The mother and daughter had moved out of town, but their new neighbors quickly learned who had settled next to them and started harshly harassing them as well as another woman who was completely unrelated to them, but who looked remarkably similar to Ludmilla. The second woman even had to carry her passport to prove her innocence. Here is an incomplete list of Alexander Spasivtsev's victims. This video might be restricted by YouTube, so I would really appreciate it if you shared it with friends so that more people could learn about this story. Thank you for watching, and as always, stay safe.